we're working to understand. All right, so today we're going to learn about loads and load paths. Uh, so before we get started, I kind of want to give you a scenario of kind of what we're working to understand and design for. Uh, so your scenario is Calvin High School is in trouble. Their gym uh, roof is showing signs of instability and could potentially collapse. Uh, if you go on our PowerPoint, you'll see that this is the Minnesota Vikings old stadium. Um, and it's kind of a good, good connection to this is because what actually happened a few years back is snow was sitting on top of this roof and it was so heavy that the roof actually collapsed and you can kind of see that here the snow started to come in. Thank, uh, we're very thankful that obviously no one was in the stadium at the time because it could have been really disastrous. Um, but that's things that we have to think about as civil engineers is we need to create a roof that can support the um, maximum amount of weight that we can need. So snow in Minnesota, there's a lot of it. So you need to design all those structural components to be able to hold that. So that's what we're going to do today. So things that we have to calculate. You need to know the loads, right? What weight is resting on that roof. You need to determine the uh, loads in order to figure out the steel decking. So if you remember that corrugated decking, the, um, we will use that again. So you'll figure out how thick that needs to be, how strong is that steel decking need to be. And then what size beam do we need? So our I-beams, here's our example. The I-beams, how big do these need to be to support that? Okay, so that's kind of our three-step process that we will be doing. So we got to learn a few things. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. So our first thing that we need to know is fixed loads, which are also called dead loads. So a dead load is anything that stays constant in that building and doesn't change. Uh, so those are walls, floors, roofs, ceilings, right? Those stay constant. We're not constantly moving our walls around, right? Once we build them, they're there forever. Um, another thing that is fixed is our MEP, which is mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So all of that equipment, right, is actually up in our ceiling. There's a lot of pipes and ductwork. That all is a lot of weight that the building has to be able to support. And then as well as our sprinkler system. So any kind of commercial structure you've been in, if you look up, there's a sprinkler head um, in case of a fire. So connected to that sprinkler head is pipes that are filled with water. Water is heavy. Okay, so you have to um, create a structural system that can support all of those loads. Okay, so these are dead loads, things that are fixed, they don't change over time. The next type of load that we have is a live load. So live loads are anything that moves or changes in your building. So people, for instance, right, you guys have passing periods, right? Sometimes there's a lot of students in here and this floor has to support a very heavy, heavy load. And then sometimes there's not, there's not a lot of load. So people constantly moving through a building. Uh, furniture, right? You rearrange furniture all the time. Um, and some furniture is heavier than others, things like that. And then vehicles. So if you have like a manufacturing big warehouse and you have forklifts and things like that, uh, vehicles that are kind of moving in and out of your building, you have to be able to support those loads. So again, live loads, those are things that change over time or even throughout the day. Um, you have to account for those. Next type of load that we have is a snow load. So I started talking about it in the Minnesota Viking Stadium. So snow loads that rest on our building, we have to be able to support all that. So if you think about uh, when it uh, starts snowing and you can make a good snowball, it's because that snow is very uh, heavy, is kind of what we call it, because it has a lot of water inside of it. Um, and that allows it to pack on very well. So if you have very heavy snowfall, right, that builds up on your roof. It's really, really heavy, and you have to have a support structure that can support it, otherwise it'll fall. So some things that we think about with a snow load is location, right? If you're in Minnesota, you're going to have a higher snow load because the snow's more there, as opposed to here, or maybe even Florida, right? Florida barely gets any snow, they don't really design for it. Um, another thing that we think about is exposure to wind. So if you're in a rural area, there's nothing stopping that wind. The wind pushes on the snow and it actually builds up. It's called a snow drift. So you'll have more snow, more heavier load. Uh, another thing is the importance of a building. So like the Minnesota Viking Stadium, that houses a lot of people. So you have to protect all those people. So you'll design for a higher load as opposed to maybe a warehouse that maybe one person goes in every month or something. The importance factor isn't as high because you're not protecting as many people. Then your roof slope, so if you have a gable roof, your snow might shed off that roof, as opposed to if you have a flat roof, it's going to sit there. I mean, it's not going anywhere until it melts. So things that we have to consider. 
So that's our snow load. Um, so how we calculate our snow load. There is a calculation here, okay? So this is your total snow load. And then we have a few given factors, okay? So um, you will have your roof slope factor. That will be given to you. You don't have to worry about that. You'll have an exposure factor that's given, thermal factor given. And then you will have to find out these two factors. So those will be in your packets. When you do the activity, you'll learn how to kind of read those. Um, so I think I actually have one of them. Okay, so for the ground snow load, use your snow load diagram. So that's this next diagram. So you'll be given um, a map of the United States. You'll say, hey, you're in Chicago. And you have to read that map. Or for instance, if we're in Springfield, Colorado, where this red dot is, so wherever that red dot is, you need to find in that area what is your snow load. And in this area, and this open space is actually 15 pounds per square foot. So that's um, the uh, ground snow load. Okay, it's 15 pounds per square foot. All right, and then we will do a check. We'll get to this in our activity. Okay, so don't worry about it right now. But you do have to kind of do a check to make sure we're at least hitting that minimum snow load that we need to design for. All right, so some other things that we need to think for, about and design for are wind loads. Uh, so wind loads, um, or excuse me, I guess I should say lateral loads, include all these different things. So a wind load, right, that pushes on our building, earthquake shaking our building, um, earth pressure. So if, you're, if you make a bunker underground, you have all this pressure from the soil pushing on your building, right? It wants to collapse in that wall. Um, so those are all kind of lateral loads. They're um, pressure loads pushing on our building from the side in the lateral direction. Okay. Some other design loads are wind loads. Um, so, uh, or excuse me, kind of continuing on wind loads. Um, what happens is, is it pushes on our building. It creates an actual suction effect. Um, so kind of an interesting side note, in Chicago, um, we have, so in the elevator shafts, that's a big, pretty much hole, it's a void in your skyscraper is the elevator shaft. Um, and what happens is when you open up your door down below, it creates a suction, um, a suction effect through the building. Um, and so if you've ever kind of been to like the Sears Tower, you walk in to an elevator, it usually kind of blows in your face because that's that suction, that air coming up and hitting you. Um, so to help minimize that effect, you actually use revolving doors so it doesn't allow a lot of air to kind of rush into the building at once um, because that can kind of create that like uplift pressure and actually kind of try to like force your roof up. All right, so we don't want that. Other things, oh, forgot about my fun fact. So the Sears Tower, speaking of the Sears Tower, thinking about wind loads and it pushing on you. Um, the Sears Tower, on average, it sways just about six inches either way. That's pretty typical. Um, but on really windy days, it um, can sway, and it's actually designed to sway up to three feet each way. Okay, so from center, it can go three feet this way, and it can go three feet that way. So can you imagine being all the way up here, and you're looking out, and your building is literally moving like six feet from side to side. It's kind of crazy. So that's when um, they actually have to close the um, glass boxes, whatever they're called, the sky towers. They close those when it gets too windy because the buildings actually swing and they don't want anything to break and crack because um, that can't happen. So it's kind of crazy engineering at its finest that you have to design for your building to actually move, right? You have to have some give. If you try to make a building that won't move at all, it's just going to end up breaking, right? It has to have some give to it so that it doesn't so earthquake loads, um, this is a huge field if you're really interested in earthquakes. Um, there is a video here that just kind of shows um, an earthquake testing site. So they kind of build different structures and shake it and kind of simulate an earthquake and do testing on it. So it's kind of cool. Things to think about. In our area, we don't really think about it that much, but obviously if you were an engineer in California, you would be. Some other things, flood loads. So if you're in a flood plane, um, my childhood home was in a flood plane. Some things that you have to think about is when it floods, right, you have all this water pushing, 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 pushing on your building. Um, it's a very, very uh, strong force. And this is actually a picture in downtown Palpine a couple of years ago. Um, it flooded so much there. Um, so that's kind of something that you have to think about. 
Okay. So lots of different types of design loads. Um, soil pressure is another one. So in your basement, this is if you've ever seen a crack in your basement wall, it's because of the soil pressure. But the soil is constantly pushing on this wall. It wants this wall to fall in. Okay, so you have to act, design that wall to be strong enough so that it doesn't push in. The deeper you go, the bigger the force on that wall. All right, so some other things. So now we learned about different types of loads. Now it's how are those loads distributed on our roof or on our structural support, okay? So we have two different types of load types. There's uniformly distributed load. So what that means is across the entire roof, it's uniform load, the same weight going across your uh, roof. Okay, so that's a uniform load, right? It's the same weight across the entire surface. As opposed to a concentrated load, it's um, a concentrated load is at a single point, right? So you have something really, really heavy on your roof, like a car or a big air handling unit. That is a concentrated load. You have to account for that load being on your roof, right? It's a big load at a centralized point. So right here, whatever beam is underneath that load, so say it's an air handling unit that doesn't move, that beam underneath there would be a lot stronger to support that load. All right, so some examples of uniformly distributed load. Um, so uniform distributed load is all your materials of your roof, right? That's a dead load. They don't go away. They're fixed. But you have to account for them. So this is uniformly distributed across. You can see all the shingles go all the way across. It's the same load across. Same thing here. You have grass, right? Green roof system, kind of. This is in Door County, if you've never seen it. Um, so your grass is your uniform load. Your concentrated loads are the big right, points of force that you have to count for. So here, a car, and here would be goats. And if you know what type of load the goats are, they're actually a live load because they're moving. Right? They're a live load as well as a concentrated load. And I have some arrows to that. All right, so now what we would do in our activity, um, once you kind of figure out all your loads, you now have all these different loads, wind loads, little snow loads, earthquake loads, and what you figure out, you use your dead load and live load always. Okay, always calculate those. And then for, you figure out what load, um, your third load is the biggest. So if you have the biggest wind load, you would use this equation to solve and make your structure component. If you have um, a big earthquake load, you would use this one, okay? For a majority of the time, we use this equation because we don't really have earthquakes or winds, so in our equation, we'll be using this one. So you have your live load, uh, or yeah, your roof live load, which is a little bit different, your snow load, and then your rain load. So whatever one of these is biggest is the one that you use. And hint, hint, in our area, it's usually snow load. The snow is really heavy. All right, so now what we're going to do um, is our activity here, and you are going to design, or was it kind of a quick run through, um, is design the roof structure for Palatine High School, okay? So they have some important things, they have 2,700 students, um, and we're going to design um, their, their uh, structural support system for their roof. So the first thing that we need to do is calculating the snow load. And I'm actually going to pause this. I'm going to make a new video. So you just learned everything.